but um, still in this pipeline, we have to think about how we do we get our packages from our, our developer desktop into our production service. And um, we normally do this with packages and with versions or version pack packages, but um, we still need some kind of process to do this. So um, we'll now look at the problem web that we had, at least one guy did something that wasn't that good, and then we'll um, somehow step by step see how we can improve this process. So um, we somehow used to have, um, or we had a guy that had a package, let's call this package Possum, with, uh, with version 1.0, and there was a bug in this package. And it's all, all this tooling around this was rather difficult. So um, what he ended up doing to fix a bug in this package was to unpack the tarball, fix the Python inside, repackage everything, and then he wanted to deploy this to production. And obviously that's not the way you want to do, uh, way you want to do things. Um, what he also tried is attach a golden copy to this particular package so that you knew that this was a special one and not the ordinary other one with the unfixed bug. Yeah, and then um, as you can imagine, if you go ahead and let your developers do stuff like this, um, you will get burned rather quickly. So um, I'm, I don't want to blame the developers because we somehow, all of us do this, we take the path of the least resistance and um, yeah, if this path is not what you want, you have to invest into tools and processes to somehow improve this one. Um, yeah, and we will now look at what we did. So basically we had this problem and thought about, okay, how do we solve this? And our solution was that we said, okay, we need immutable packages. So um, when we create a Python package, we want to create it only once and then store it forever. And um, when we give a version for this Python package, we want to derive this version from our Git repository. So um, that we know exactly, okay, it has this git tag, and there are five commits after it with this checksum, so we know exactly when we see a package, what, what's the code that somewhere is in this package. And last but not least, we want to have those as wheels. This means we don't, don't want to use source distributions, but wheel packages, because a wheel is basically just a zip archive of your Python files and C code and whatever, and your installation, you just unpack the wheel, or pip unpacks the wheels for you, so this is, much safer than a source distribution. And um, what we also do is when we install a package, we pin everything. So we are basically sure that not only a package is of this version, but also all your requirements are as you expect. Um, I have a short example how we actually do this because um, most of our internal tools use a open source package called Setup Tools SCM, or we use a wrapper around it which we call Pi Scaffold. Um, but the idea is basically all the same. Um, I have an example a repository here. It's call, also called Possum. Uh, it has two Git tags, a 1.1, 1.0. Uh, and when you go ahead and create your Python setup by BDist wheel, so we build a wheel, what Possum does, it goes ahead, uh, what uh, the setup tool SCM does, it goes ahead, looks at your tags, so it sees, okay, there's a tag 1.1, and um, it sees, okay, I have two commits that go beyond this tag, so it creates a version number called, um, so. 1.2 because it increments by one and then the number of commits I've made and the checksum. So basically, um, if you want unique version numbers for your packages, look at Setup Tools STM, it will basically solve this for you. Um, so with, from the stuff we've mentioned before, we now have the, um, yeah, the foundation laid out. We, we have packages that have unique version numbers, but now we have to upload them somewhere because it's not enough that um, you've created a unique package on your desktop or on Jenkins or whatever, but you have to do something with it. And um, for us, is it we upload those packages to DevP. Um, DevP is a package server for Python packages and for wheels, and um, it's developed by Holger Krekel and has the great advantage that it's compatible with pypypython.org. So um, you can use it just in the way you would look, you know, we use pypy, but you can run it on your own, own hardware and your own um, on stack, so you don't have to upload your uh, packages to the internet, but can use your local, your local DevP server. Uh, short example how this looks like. Um, in the first line we say, okay, I want to talk with this DevP server and this particular user on, and this index. Um, we log in as this user and then say, okay, upload this package, and the package ends up on the server. And uh, what you can basically see in the last line, it's rather easy to install a package. It's an ordinary pip command 
you just specify the index you want to install from. So um, you check the URL of your DevPy server, DevPy server, and can install from it. So basically, from a pure perspective of what DevPy offers, that that's it for um, for the view of one developer. Um, the developers also get a um, web web uh, website. Also similar to PyPyPython.org, you get the metadata, you get um, which packages have been uploaded. So um, yeah, see the, you see this documentation and the doc string. That's basically what you get out of the, out of the box. Um, so we can now look at the entire workflow that we have, we have built. Um, so what you see is we have our developers, they check into Git. So you get uh, great tags and commits and whatever. Um, then Jenkins goes ahead, um, fetches the latest Latest, um, latest checkout, builds these packages, runs all tests, and once all unit and integration tests have passed, um, our Jenkins jobs go ahead and upload these packages to our DevP server. And um, we basically store all our packages on DevP forever, and then when we want to install something from production, we just look at DevP, install from there, and um, yeah, that's how we somehow do, do these things. And I guess for some of you in the audience, this might all already be a workflow that's suitable. Um, for us at Blue Yonder, it is a little bit more difficult, at least because we have a few constraints. Um, first of all, we have multiple teams that um, collaborate. So we have multiple teams, multiple artifacts that upload stuff. And um, we want to somehow keep the artifacts of these different teams separated. Um, so Good example, before we used DevP, we just had one network share, and we uh, placed all our packages in a large folder on this network share, and it was somehow a total chaos, because some, sometimes people upload stuff and buggy versions, and you didn't know, didn't know who did what. So um, for our new solution with DevP, we want to separate teams a little bit, like namespaces. So that's the first constraint. Second constraint is um, we have not only Python code, but we also ship stuff like Fortran code or NumPy or whatever. So stuff that's compiled, and we don't want to um, we don't want to compile in production. So we don't want to have GCC on our, our um, production servers, and we don't want to spend the time compiling our desktop. So what we do is we upload binary packages to DevP, um, all in the form of wheels. So we must support this, this as well. And the last thing is. Um, even though we want to keep our teams separated, um, we still want to somehow have it easy to manage their dependencies. So if my package depends on the package of another team and some of those open source packages, we have to somehow provide a solution that's working for all of this. And um, we'll now look into the DevP box up there so we can see how, it, um, how we've achieved this. So, okay, up to our DevP usage. Um, Shortly back to the example we've seen before, um, here are two, two important things to notice. First of all, we look at the wheel. Um, I've said that we want to upload um, we want to upload binary packages, and those are built on a specific distribution. For example, on our Jenkins, we go ahead and build a package on Debian 7, or uh, on Debian 8. But unfortunately, this same package won't run on Debian 7, because we've compiled against some system library, so it won't work. And um, Wheel, some, the wheel format, someone has a support for this, but unfortunately it only says Linux, but it doesn't say what kind of. So um, we have, yeah, we need a workaround to this when we lay out our DevP users and indices, and this is the second important thing. You see it in the upper corner. Um, DevP is a little bit, um, yeah, DevP supports users and indices, and you can mul have multiple users and multiple indices, uh, and each user can have multiple indices. It's a little bit like GitHub. For GitHub, you have multiple users, and each user can have multiple repositories. It's the same on DevP, just with users and indices. And um, yeah, you can think of an index just like a bag of um, your Python packages. Okay, so how do we use this to uh, manage our stuff? So what we ended up doing is um, we created, for each team, we created a DevP user. So they have their own um, credentials to log in, and then for each, um, operating system that we support, we create one index. And when we now build packages on Jenkins, we upload to this particular index. So when we build on Debian 7, we upload to Debian 7. When we build on Debian 8, we upload to Debian 8. Um, this works for these binary packages, but there's also um, packages like, they're pure Python packages, no compiled stuff. 
you don't always want to upload these to all, your oper to all the operating system indices. So we also introduce a so-called generic index where you upload this pure Python packages. And then we use a feature of DevP which is called um, index inheritance. So we can say, okay, this um, Debian 7 index inherits from the generic index. And then you can see on the Debian 7 index all packages that are also available on generic. Um, so this is basically the two for one team. But as I said, we have multiple teams. And um, so what we do is we create one of these users for each team and then have a so-called aggregation index or we call it the platform index. And um, it inherits from the corresponding teams. So if you look at the platform index, it has a, let's say Debian 7 index and this Debian 7 index inherits from the Debian 7 indices of all the different teams. So in the end, when a user wants to install a library or whatever, he just writes this command line below. So you say, okay, pip install my package from this index server or from this dev pi, and on this dev pi, take this platform, and the last part is the operating system you want to use, and then he gets the pre-compiled packages for this particular operating system. Um, so this is basically how we install all of our packages, except a few um, specialties, and um, one of these is that, oh, yeah, our teams work, and now we have the open source packages. These are not built by our, by our, or crafted by our teams, but it's basically all what's available in the open source community, let's say Django and Request and whatever. And um, the different teams depend on those open source packages. As, um, so the software won't work without them, but we have to upload them somewhere. And um, what we decided is, okay, we somehow treat the whole open source community as one team in our company and created one particular user for them. Again, with the different operating system indices, and um, we now have a company-wide list where all packages stand and that we depend on. And um, we build those using a tool which we call DevP Builder that uploads them to, the, um, to our OSS user and from there we can install them. So yeah, that's basically the stuff for what we use for libraries and so on. But um, there's also a thing, yeah, some, sometimes you have packages which are not a library but a specific application with a specific configuration that's supposed to run at one specific mesh and you don't really want to share it. For example, um, we do machine learning models, so when you have a model for one specific customer, you don't want to upload it to the upper wider part because then everybody could use it, but they are not supposed to, or it wouldn't make any sense for them. So we also create consumer indices, which are basically just indices inheriting from the, from the platform so they get everything, but can also upload their own stuff. Um, yeah, that's basically our index layout, how we use it, and I can guess that some of you think that's totally complicated and somewhat unnecessary, but um, for us it has been a great success. Um, we somehow introduced DevP in our company about a year ago. Um, within days or even uh, days or weeks, um, everybody has migrated to use it, so um, the adoption has been great. And in this one year we have uh, uploaded about 10,000 packages and documentation tables. Um, we upload those to about 315 indices. And um, yeah, those have been downloaded about, or the downloads accumulated to about um, 18 terabytes. So that's quite a lot for um, packages. Um, but we were able to do all this with only um, yeah, small machines with four, four cores and four gigabit of RAM. So the whole setup is rather lightweight, yeah, which is somewhat a great thing. And um, so, but. We are now using all of this on Jenkins, on desktop, on service, everywhere. And uh, we somewhat have the problem, if DevP goes down, most of our developers costs can go home for this day. Because yeah, when they commit stuff, the Jenkins job won't run because they can't upload the packages. So basically, if DevP goes down, we, can, we can't work. So um, we have to invest, how do we make this stable? How do we um, keep it up all the time? And um, this is how we do it. So there, um, this is now a single host setup, so we just look what processes are running on this host. So um, at, at the front, we have an Nginx, which is some of the recommended setup. Um, but what we now do, we use a replica and a master. And this is a concept of DevP, which is somewhat a, you can think of it as a, let's say, transparent cache. Um, if you talk to the replica, it can directly serve you packages if you want to install something. But if you want to upload, 
uh, package. The replica transparently talks to the master. The master um, yeah, performs the state change, uploads your package, and finally, replica can serve your request and says, okay, everything worked. For us, this has the great advantage that, um, for example, we want to do a backup of the master. We can simply go ahead, disable the master, but the replica is still up. So the requests will come down, go to the engine, the nginx will pass them to the replica, replica will allow people to install packages. Um, if an upload, and someone tries to upload a package, this won't work, but at least we can serve traffic. If the, um, if the backup is done, we reactivate the master, and everything works again. So we can somehow do zero downtime uh, updates or backups for installation, and it also helps when we have to do a major version update of DevP, that you have to export all the state from the master, create a new master, import all data again. And this is also a case where we can use um, the setup, so we just disable the master, create a new one, but the replica is still serving traffic. Um, now, this is a single host setup, but you still have the problem, okay, this single host might go down. Um, so, we somehow have ex extended this to a multi-host multi setup. Um, the idea is basically the same. You have two hosts, um, a reverse proxy in front, this is which basically routes incoming traffic to one host or the other, and um, on each host, we again have a replica and a single master we're talking to. Um, DevP supports only one master, but that's not a problem in our case because um, we, we basically get the same guarantee as we, as, as we had before because um, if the host A goes down, it's all right because host B is still there to serve traffic using his replica. Um, if host B goes down, we can still serve traffic and also uh, upload packages. And for us, the serving traffic part is this important, so we always want to allow people to install packages because if um, they can't upload packages, they, all, they only do this during daytime. So we also can fix our host setup during office hours. But um, the installation path also has, has to work at night. So this is basically a great setup for us because um, yeah, we are somehow, um, we, we don't need really need, um, yeah, we don't need to stand up at night to fix this. Um, yeah, this is somehow the, how we use FP, the general structure. Just a short repetition of uh, what, what you've seen. Um, so as first I said, we create real packages, so binary packages. Um, we give them unique version numbers using Git. We then upload all this to DevP indices um, with one index operating system. Here's one fact that I've missed before. Um, we flag all our DevP indices as non-volatile. This means you can upload new packages to them, but you can't override existing ones, and you can't delete existing ones. Um, so this is important because then we, yeah, we can say we only create packages and a user doesn't have to have to fear that once you've installed something and installs it again, you get another version or whatever, but he's always sure to get the right one. Um, yeah. Last thing is we create users for internal teams. And um, so, um, yeah, that's basically it. And if you adopt this setup, um, the first three steps might be enough for you for now, but in the future, if you think about, okay, it has to be highly available, you can look into the replica feature and uh, use it for your advantage. Okay, so, but uh, one last tip for you, if you decide, okay, um, this is somewhat interesting, two lessons that we have learned that might help you. First of all, um, you want to set up, a, set up a test server that your users can use. Um, for us, we had many cases where people created new build jobs for new artifacts, and as you know, Jenkins, yeah, your first Jenkins job, your first run won't always succeed, so you get many broken packages, and uh, then the people had to come to us and say, okay, can you please delete this package because, yeah, someone messed up the versioning or whatever, but all these index are, are non-volatile, so they can't delete it themselves, they have to come to us. And this is somewhat overhead, and um, you can solve this if, if, they also, if you also give them a server, let's say that's your test DevP server, just installed there. Um, that's somewhat helping there. And the other thing is, um, you, it's somewhat advisable to not let your users use DevP client directly. Um, it has some important command line argument that you have to use in a shared environment or when you're using stuff like Git STM, and people tend to forget it. Um, so if you're using client wrapper, you can somehow uh, fix those uh, arguments for all of your users so they can't do it wrong. Yeah, so um, that's basically the run through um, through our setup. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, so thank you for your attention.
um, unopened for questions now, but you can also come by the booth and ask after afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, uh, you were talking about those, uh, the group for all the uh, dependencies from the open source community. Yeah. Can DevP work like a proxying uh, repository for them? Yeah. So, um, so, so if I uh, request a new uh, package that uh, haven't, hasn't been downloaded and I target DevPy, DevPy would download it and cache it for, la for later, right? DevPy has a mirroring feature, so by default you wouldn't need this OSS index, how we use it. By default, DevPy has a speci specific user and index, it's called root slash pypy, and um, you get all the packages from pypypython.org by default. So you don't have to do anything manually, uh, it's just that we decided, okay, we want to repackage all those packages as wheels and most of them are not available as wheels on pypypython.org, so we somehow say, okay, we want to um, upload them specifically, and um, it also has the advantage if you somehow do this, man this manual, or somehow manual step that you say, okay, I want to explicitly say these should be on my DevP, um, that if the company that's, for example, we do software as a service, so we have to look at the licenses we are using, so um, we, are, we are not allowed to really use any pack, or all of package on, uh, that are available on the internet, but we have to look at the licenses. For example, BSV or MIT is okay. So um, we somehow do this license check when users say, okay, please add this package and this versions to this large whitelist, and then our tool goes ahead and uploads them automatically. So we have this step in between, but you don't need it. You can, by default, use the PyP mirroring feature. Yeah. Okay, thank you. How do you do authentication when installing packages? So I assume the the uh, DevPy server is uh, available publicly, so the, like in the internet, so the servers can actually install from it. Um, you mean authentication during install or during upload? Yes, exactly, because I think you upload private packages, so not everybody should be able to install them. Um, it's, that's a problem somehow. Um, the server standing in our company is only internally, so it's not available from the internet. Um, this is somehow feasible for us because we don't run stuff on the open cloud, but only in, on our own computers and our own data centers. So this works for us. Um, DevP by default, you have passwords when you upload stuff. You can um, use LDAP users, LDAP groups for authentication, or just users you created yourself on the DevP server. That works. Um, but during install, there's no authentication there. Um, so by default, if you know an index and user and a package that's there, you can install it. Um, yeah, that's the current. So, so the only way would be basic auth or something, something like that from HTTP. Once again, please. Basic authentication would work. That's what we use, but I thought maybe there's a better, uh, better solution. Um, there, that might work. Um, would I would be interested to talk to you afterwards. So um, yeah, but for now we have it. It's basically open for us. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the talk. So uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you like to use to build wheels in, um, in your product repositories, but also use the mirroring feature. So is there any way that I can have like a local index with my packages that are aren't exposed, still use the mirroring feature, but I can build a wheel for LXML or NumPy or whatever? That so works, that works. Um, because I said you have this root PyP index, and what you can do is, you can in, when you, you have your own index, you can in, inherit from this root PyP. So first of all, you will see your packages and all from the internet. And if you then decide, okay, I want this specific package as a wheel, you repackage it as a wheel and upload it to your index. Um, and then you basically get the rest of the internet, your packages, and this one as a wheel. But um, there's one thing you have to look out for, um, that somehow is a security issue. Because um, if you have the it's a feature, um, when you upload a package that's available on your index and also in the internet, DevP goes ahead and says, okay, um, I won't look at, uh, at the internet for this package anymore because um, otherwise some guy might go to pypypython.org and upload a package, your private package with a higher version number and then you would get this. So um, there's a whitelisting feature and you have to explicitly say, I uploaded this one as a wheel, please also look for other stuff on the internet. That's 
so I kind of have to pin the version. If I upload LXML 3.4 and 3.5 gets uploaded, I have to rebuild it. So that, that, that will work, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the talk, firstly. Uh, secondly, do you support um, something like snapshotting? I want to deploy a version in production, and I want to know that version 3.8, for example, only has a set of packages, and I want to still be able to develop further. So unfortunately, I didn't get the question, but can you repeat it, please? Do you support uh, snapshotting of indexes? Um, by default, there's no such feature, but you can somehow rebuild it yourself. I mean, there's a feature called, uh, you can defy, it's defy push, so you can say, okay, on this particular index, it's this text and this version, and I want to move it to another index without modifying it. Um, so you can basically do the snapshotting like, uh, okay, now move all these packages to another index, and then this can't be modified. Is this what you what you want? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, maybe an explanation why we don't use this feature, um, because, um, yeah, we have some guys in our company that likes to automate stuff. So they would simply automate this def p push command, and then there wouldn't be any advantage. So we said, okay, we don't need it because they will automate it anyway at the end of the Jenkins job. And yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Thanks very much, Stefan. <laughs>